All right, well, welcome to Exploring A Course in Miracles, our live recording of our podcast. I'm Emily Bennington with the Circle of Atonement, and I'm here with Circle founder Robert Perry. And today we are talking about Holy Week. Holy Week, of course, marks the final week of Jesus's life from his entry into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to his crucifixion on what is oddly called Good Friday to his resurrection on Easter Sunday. Given the that the resurrection of Jesus sets the stage for the rise of Christianity, which remains the most popular and widespread religion to this day, Christianity has billions of followers around the world and has had a tremendous influence on culture for centuries. Uh, it's, it's no exaggeration to say that this one week that happened 2000 years ago changed the world forever. Without the resurrection, uh, Jesus's life most, look, most likely would have been forgotten. He would have been another troublemaker crucified by the Romans. But if his resurrection is true, then that single event is by far the most important thing that has ever happened or will ever happen in recorded history. And there is compelling evidence to uh, show that the resurrection did actually happen, which we'll get into. But first, I want to say that the reason why Robert and I are doing this podcast is because during Holy Week, which this year is April 10th through the 17th, we are hosting a series of five events so that we can all walk through this week together and celebrate the sacred time together. Each event that we're hosting for Holy Week will be held at 11 a.m. Eastern and will go for about an hour. So we'll be joining on Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. All of the events will be recorded, so you won't miss anything if you can't attend live. And if you want to learn more or register for Holy Week, you can find all of the information at circleofa.org forward slash events. And if you'd like to attend, but you're facing financial hardship, just email info at circleofa.org and we will be glad to help out. Uh, no one is turned away from circle programming for an inability to pay. This is the second Holy Week series that Robert and I have done together, and we plan to do this every year for as long as we are alive and kicking. It has long been a dream of ours to give course students a course-based way to celebrate holidays that have some connections, some connection to the teachings in the course. The course offers just stunning reframes on New Year's, Easter, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas in particular. And so one of our, our mini goals here at The Circle is to embed what the course has to say about these holidays into the minds of students so that we can all take part in these celebrations, but in a whole new way. Along that line, Holy Week has been tremendously significant to Christians, but it's not something that we tend to associate with A Course in Miracles. That said, the beginning of chapter 20 in the text of the complete and annotated edition of A, of a Course in Miracles has a section called Holy Week. And this material is also found in the Foundation for Inner Peace version of the course as well. So Holy Week has been part of the course's teaching from the very beginning. It's a little all over the place though. Um, the Holy Week section talks about Palm Sunday. Uh, that's in chapter 20. There's Teach Only Love, the section that addresses the crucifixion. That's in chapter six. There's the message of the crucifixion. It's also in chapter six. And so what, what we're doing with the Holy Week series is pulling out all of the relevant teachings on the specific events of Holy Week and sharing them in the order of the events themselves. The course has just a, a truly profound way of looking at this time. It calls Holy Week the symbol of our entire spiritual journey, and it gives us just a, a, a stunning reframe of basically everything we've been taught uh, and, and about the significance and the meaning of this time. So Robert, I am so looking forward to this conversation and to another Holy Week with you. Yeah, yeah, it's great that 
I mean, this is really your, your kind of brainchild. You, you have a passion of, for seeing this established as a yearly tradition for course students. And so this is our year number two, and I'm looking forward to it as well. I do, but at the same time, it came, my passion for it kind of springs from your passion for it because I, I, I will never forget in, the, in Easter of 2017, you, when we were sort of just getting to know each other, you sent an email to me that said that you have this, what you called a little Easter celebration and it was to read uh, the courses sections on Easter and to read an article that you'd written about the case for the resurrection. And you asked, you said that you normally did that alone, but you asked mm -hmm. if I wanted to join with you. And I said, yes. And so we did. And then we started doing that for Easter. And then last year was the first time we kind of opened it up. And, and, I, and I do really feel like this, this, this always, it should have, you know, it started with, with you then, it, then mm. me and you, and then, you know, it just should really be something that, that is part of at least the circle community, if not the more broad course community as well. Mm. Mm. I, you're right. I just didn't have that story in my mind. I've been, for probably 15 years, um, at least, I've been having my own private Easter celebration where mm -hmm. I, read, I read the Easter poem that Helen wrote, and I really focus on... <clears throat> historical evidence for the resurrection and the course's message about the resurrection. And I try to grab a couple hours every Easter morning before, you know, all the stuff starts up. Uh -huh. But that's, you're right. That's been a completely private, personal thing. Yeah, I have really sort of treasured memories of that time. And it's, and it's, it's great to be able to, to open it up and to share it with everyone. So, so what we're going to do today is to go through each event of Holy Week and tell you just a little bit more about it. This podcast isn't meant to be a substitute for the events themselves. And so this, this podcast we're thinking will be, a short, will be shorter than most. Uh, we were planning for 30 minutes, but we'll, we can never be all that brief. So uh, we'll see how long this ends up taking. Robert, um, before we go through the individual days, I mm -hmm. just want to kind of say some, some general things. Sure. Uh, you know, what's so interesting about Holy Week is you have the final days of the world's most influential religious figure being, you know, having this eventually earth-shaking significance that, that changes the world. Uh, and what the course would say is there was something of immense significance in that final week, in those final days. There was something real and of God that happened. It's just that we didn't understand. And yeah. we surrounded it with a lot of mythology, a lot of what ultimately was misinterpretation. You know, so we almost like buried what was truly real underneath layers of our interpretations, our mythology. And it, it can seem like, well, the answer to all that is we just ditch the whole thing. And the course's approach, of course, is to take off all those layers and uncover the, the, the real and truly liberating meaning that was there in the original events. We just couldn't see it. Yeah. And it does that all throughout the events of Holy Week and really all throughout so many uh, concepts that we think we know. The Course just steps in and infuses them with new meaning and gives us this whole new beautiful reframe. And, and the, the Holy Week is no exception there. So Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday. This is, as we know, the, the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jer the city of Jerusalem. As the story goes, Jesus rode into the city on a donkey and his followers waved palm branches and laid them at his feet. That's why it's called Palm Sunday, um, historically, traditionally. Um, as course students, what is the important 
importance of this first day of Holy Week? Why is it significant to our journey? Well, I think before even going into that, we should say that, I mean, from my standpoint, you know, I, I do think that Jesus is, is this world's spiritual leader. And yet I feel like turning, turning the religion that arose in his name into, to some degree, hero worship. So he's the king entering Jerusalem, you know, yay, is what, is where it went wrong. I always thought it was really strange that it was like, he was so humble that he rode in on a donkey, but at the same time, the whole city was celebrating his arrival. So it was not all that humble. It's kind of a mixed message there. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and we love the idea of, you know, we're following this great king. And yet, I just don't know how spiritually edifying that is at all. How does that help us drop our ego? How does that help us learn how to love? to engage in, you know, to be honest, what I see as a, as a kind of hero worship, which humans are, you know, that's in our bones. We just do it all over the place, you know, especially in religion and spirituality. So the course just drops that meaning entirely, I think, to its credit. And instead, it sees Palm Sunday not so much in historical terms. I don't think it's denying that it happened, but it's, it sees Palm Sunday very much uh, in a similar way to how it sees Christmas, where it just ignores the historical element of it and it uses the event as a symbol for something in our own spiritual journey. Um, and you mentioned it uses it as a symbol for our, our own journey. And additional to that, the main focus is it becomes a symbol for our brother's journey and how we can help that journey or hinder it. He's on his way to resurrection. Are we going to get in the way and sort of divert him off another path or are we going to speed him on his way to resurrection? The specifics of that, of course, we'll, we'll talk about um, on Palm Sunday. But by seeing it in those terms, it goes from this hero worship where we're waving palm branches for the great king to this really practical issue. You know, our brother is God's son on a journey to ultimate liberation. What role are we going to play? Are we going to divert him or speed him along his way? I remember as part of growing up in a traditionally Christian church, Palm Sunday was a really big deal. We had the, the palm branches right, and we yeah. would wave them. And, and it, I remember as a kid really liking that and really feeling that like that was, that was, a, that was a highlight of the year. It was really fun. But yeah, my in, church did similar things. In the, yeah, it's pretty common practice, but in the course, there's, there's not a significance on, on, palms at all but there is a significance on lilies can you touch base on that very quickly before we move on because it's just a beautiful teaching and I'd like to share it yeah well the course the course uses lilies because they're associated with easter as symbols of forgiveness i mean the implication is that resurrection is the fruit of forgiveness that that uh, you know forgiveness in a sense contains within itself the resurrection that you see on Easter Sunday. And so the question is, you know, we can give a gift of lilies to our brother. We can give him the message that he's forgiven. And that's what speeds him toward his own personal resurrection, you know, or we can give him something else. A crown of thorns. So right. we can right. give him the crown of thorns and our, along with our judgment and, and our guilt, or we can give him the, the lilies of forgiveness and innocence and innocence right. and peace so yeah, I love that idea. Symbol. yeah so the next event in holy week is monday thursday and monday thursday traditionally honors the last supper through the ritual of the eucharist or communion where we uh, eat the wafer and drink the grape juice that symbolizes jesus's body and his blood 
Um, that is a truly sacred practice in Christianity, but the course is quite down on that. So let's talk about it. The course is really down on that. Uh, there were a few, there are a few passages in the course that address it very directly. One in chapter two, one in chapter seven, one in chapter- Well, it is pretty 19. macabre if you think about it. If you think about it, and, and the things the Course says echoes things Christianity's critics said going way back to the early Christian centuries. You know, here we are supposedly, at least symbolically, I mean, and, and more than symbolically if you're Catholic, we're eating someone's flesh, we're drinking his blood. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of macabre. And the notion is, is that we are consuming our savior and thereby taking you know, he sacrificed his body and we're taking his sacrifice into us. I saw a video the other day where a woman said, how would you, you know, this is how you'd explain Christianity if you talk about it in the way that a Christian missionary talks about other religions. So you kind of see it from the They're outside. And, cannibals and... Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can just imagine, you know, so you're eating his blood and eating his body and drinking his blood and he's always present with you. And, and it just sounded really primitive. Mm -hmm. And yet she wasn't, it wasn't inaccurate. It was just talked about from a different angle, one that doesn't exalt it. And so the course has a number of passages. There's three I know of that are very direct and explicit and other ones that are more indirect references like, like symbolic allusions to, to the Eucharist or to communion. And the course just doesn't like the whole thing. It does like the chalice though. <laughs> yeah, it likes the chalice. It likes the chalice. I keep bringing us back to these you know, physical things, but let's talk about that because, again, so many of us have associations with these days if you grew up in, in traditional Christianity. So the association with Maundy Thursday is the wafer and the grape juice or the, or the wine if you were in a cool church. Um, I drank a lot of grape juice. Um, <laughs> yeah, my church had wine. Did you really? Yeah. But uh, well, I was always a kid sneaking in and drinking the grape juice. So if it were real wine, I've been in real trouble. But uh, <laughs> um, the the chalice, though, also represents forgiveness in the course. So do you want to say anything about that? Because it's also a beautiful idea. There are some real, just a few, but but I think very potent references to the chalice of atonement, and you know, the there's a even early on in the course's dictation. Jesus talked about Helen having a role in giving, handing people back their own chalice, which they had thrown away. Um, and, and now they're afraid of it, but certain people in her life were ready. And, and therefore it was her role to hand them back their chalice, which was a statement that you were forgiven, you're reconciled with God. Yeah. And that involves that readiness that I know you love. I do. I do. I, I did a Sunday gathering on the idea of the, the, the chalice, the Sunday gathering message on it, because I not only think the chalice is just a beautiful symbol and, and far less macabre than the idea of eating his body and drinking his blood, but that you pass along this, this symbol of forgiveness to your brothers. And, and in the course, when he talks about readiness, he talks about the idea of three-way readiness uh, in relation to the chalice and so we do have people that were meant to forgive to pass that chalice to they their readiness is up to them our readiness is up to us Jesus is always ready to help us and so I just find that idea to be really beautiful that Jesus is always there to be involved in our relationships and to help us in the process of forgiveness as long as we take care of our own readiness and our own willingness by clearing out, out, our, out our blocks of grievances and whatnot. Yeah, and I like the idea that we just take care of our own readiness. And there, he says, their readiness is up to them. So we can't make them ready. Mm -hmm. That's not our job. We don't have to worry about that. They really have that as their job. Um, and of course, we don't have to make Jesus ready. We just have to concern ourselves with our readiness. Yeah, but it's just so sweet that he's there for both, right? He's there to help us with ours. He's there to help them with theirs. 
And yes, there's agency involved. We have to to want to be ready. Mm. But I just I love that that I love thinking of him as part of the whole process. Yeah. And and just to go on with with the course has this negative view of of communion as we've practiced it in, in church. Um, but it then at, as a replacement for that, it offers its idea of communion. And its idea is that communion is not consuming his body, it's the joining of minds. And it talks about this joining of minds in terms of a symbol of this feast, this feast of love. And the feast is one where we all gather and what we're quote unquote feasting on is news of expressions of love in the world. We look out in the world and we say, oh, there's an expression of love that happened there. There's one that happened there. And, and we gather in a feast of those. And what's interesting about that to me, um, and Jesus says he will, he will join us in that feast. What's very interesting is that the scholars that I have read tend to not believe that there was something like the Eucharist instituted the night before Jesus died. Um, it goes back to very early traditions, even the Apostle Paul spoke of it, but it's so filled with a Christian theology that developed after the crucifixion. You know, this is my body broken for you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what the scholars that I have read tend to believe instead is that there was a historical basis for the Eucharist, but a lot got lost in translation. And that what the historical basis was, was where Jesus had this practice of, of dining with anyone and everyone, with people he was not supposed to dine with as, as a holy man, you know, dining with what they you know called sinners in the New Testament. Um, and so he had these joyous, inclusive meals um, at which everybody was welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, his, his table fellowship was in a sense mirrored in this idea in the course that real communion is a joining of minds in love. It's not eating and drinking his flesh and blood. Yeah, what an extraordinary idea. And, and again, just a beautiful reframe that, it, and as you were saying about Palm Sunday, it takes the focus off of him as this singular figure and expands it to what is truly applicable to all of us. So we, when we think of Maundy Thursday, for example, it's not just like the consuming of his flesh, which again is weird, but it also makes it just about him and expanding it to, to his message of love. And, and so it, it also expands it in the sense that it's not just about the one dinner that he had in the night before he died. He was practicing this table fellowship all through his very short uh, ministry. And so again, it just gives us that opportunity to, to look at ourselves and say, how often are we extending love to, to those that that we don't consider to be quote unquote worthy um, mm -hmm. regardless of what society thinks right like uh, it's just the same issues that were present in Jesus's day who deserves to be in and who deserves to be out quote unquote mm -hmm. are present right now and and the message therefore is applicable right now yeah yeah yeah, there are always going to be outgroups, outcasts, those who are the undesirables. And then, the, of course, the label changes depending on what group you're part of, but the other yeah. groups are always there. Yeah, it, it's, it's true. Um, I, I, this is a little off topic, but I always thought it was very interesting that during the, the riots on January 6th, during the insurrection in the morning, Mike Pence was a patriot and in the afternoon he was like a baby molester or something it was like the whole opinion shifted from the in group to the out group in, in like yeah. a matter of a couple of hours and so that gives you some indication of our psyche around all of this 
It can be very swift. Yeah. Okay, so the next event in our Holy Week schedule is Good Friday. And the, you, I know, have shared before that Holy Week, had, or excuse me, Good Friday had typically been a very somber occasion at the church where you grew up. I, I think you even shared that the sanctuary was, was draped in black and everyone came in very slowly as if it well, were a funeral march. Yeah, there was no music when you came in. The lights, you, you, when you left, when you left, the lights had gone out one by one, I think as the seven words from the cross were read. So each time there was another word read, more lights went out until you left completely in silence. And there was, at my church, there was a cross that, that hung from the ceiling um, over the altar up front. And that cross was draped in a, in a black veil. Yeah. So Good Friday uh, obviously commemorates the day in which Jesus was crucified and, and died. And this is yet another area where the course gives us a beautiful reframe. So let's talk about that. Yeah, what's interesting is, you know, this reframe goes back to the earliest parts of the text, which were dictated in like 1966. Um, and he takes really strong issue with the traditional interpretation of the crucifixion. And so many spiritual teachings that, that I was reading, you know, a long time ago, they, they tried to take that old interpretation and kind of spiritualize it, right? So he didn't, maybe he didn't die for our sins or maybe he did in the Edgar Casey readings, I believe he did, or, but maybe he died as a sacrifice, like a way of sacrificing the lower self. Um, so there's some way in which a lot of teachings that I read would take the traditional interpretation and sort of put a more spiritual cast on it and in the course, it is just rejected completely. And what I find interesting is that in the decades since, I don't think because of the course's influence, but it's just happened, uh, more and more humanity is saying, ew, like, like so we're <laughs> gonna believe that, that God had to send his son down to die this horrible- Took us a while. <laughs> gory, right, brutal death, and that pays for our sins, God tells us just to forgive each other, but he can't do that. He needs payment in blood. Um, as an act of love. As an act of love. And, you know, it's, it's be, that story, it's not so much being disproven. How do you disprove it? It's kind of like the Santa Claus story where it's becoming just no longer credible as humanity is growing up. And that's, that's, I think great to see because it is a gruesome story that says really dark things about God. Yeah, yeah, it does. And and as we say so often here, it sets the stage for again not only the in group and the out group, but that fear of God. That well, if he sure. could do that to Jesus, the son he loves, then what on earth will he do to me? And so then we spend our lives with this subconscious or even conscious running from God, being afraid of God, and then how does that act out in our, in our lives? It's, it's pretty destructive. Yeah. Um, and so, so just, just on the positive ahead. side, I don't, we don't have to dwell here, but I think that the brilliance of the course on this level is it says it was never a sacrifice for sin. It was a teaching demonstration. And, and briefly, it was a demonstration that even under what we would consider the absolute worst conditions, we can still teach defenselessness and forgiveness and love. And so the course makes the message of the crucifixion teach only love because it says that's what Jesus did during his crucifixion in spite of you know, a, a truly extreme assault being perpetrated on him at the time. Yeah, and, and that's that really, as you're saying, is a message that we we really needed. We needed to let go of the old messaging that God didn't sacrifice his own son to atone for the sins of humanity. Uh, the way in which it's described doesn't even make any sense. But um, like you, you do this brutally unloving thing as an act of love. <laughs> I, I just, I can't, so many of us can't wrap our head around it. Yeah. But at the same time, 
I think there's there's such beauty in what the course has to say about the crucifixion uh, and the message there that that no matter what we can teach only love because we look at the world today and we think okay well I can forgive this thing but I can't forgive that thing I can forgive the the I don't know the person who cut me off in traffic but I absolutely cannot forgive Putin for what he's doing in the world right now and what Jesus's life gives us is a true example of someone who was able to love right to the very moment of his own death. And so when Jesus says you can teach only love, you know, he means it because he lived it. And, and that's yeah. extraordinary. And that was really the point he says is that he was showing us an extreme example which basically says if he could do it under the most extreme conditions, we ourselves can do it under milder conditions, which makes the crucifixion not kind of this inspirational belief we might have or, or you know, threatening belief or uncomfortable belief. It makes it something that is applicable for us every day. Because some of us you know, can forgive a distant dictator before we can forgive our spouse for something, you know, a, a look even. <laughs> yeah, it also, I think it places the real significance on Jesus. And what I mean by the real significance, it's like, it's not that he's just special, for lack of a better word, because he is God's son. It's another course reframe. We're all God's son, including Jesus. But what, what makes Jesus significant from a course perspective is that it says he was the first to complete his part perfectly. So he was a man who was in a body who was able to teach only love. He was able to hear only the Holy Spirit. And thus he was able to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was able to, to forgive when he's hanging there torn apart on the cross. And, and as you're saying, we have so many smaller crucifixions in our own life we get looked at the wrong way and we hold on to it for years and and so th that's the real again the real significance of Jesus in my mind is that because he was in a body and able to truly absorb and embody these teachings that seem so radical to us that he proves it's possible for us yeah, and it makes the crucifixion such a powerful teaching lesson. So, you know, in the old view, it's this sacrifice, and no one really needed to have seen it for it to work, right? Jesus needs to need to get clobbered and die for our sins, and God would say, okay, the ritual worked, and, and I'm, you know, I'm satisfied now. But in this new view, it was all about he was showing onlookers, you know, either at that time or throughout subsequent history, he was showing them a teaching demonstration, and it's one we can use every day, and I think that is an amazing concept. I said we were going to try and be done by 30 yeah, I know. past, we're, and it's 30 yeah. past, and we have two more events to go, so. <laughs> um, you got one more to go, right? But we have um, Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. Yeah, well, Holy Saturday, do you mind if I just step in with Holy Saturday? Well, in the interest of time, please do. Okay, so Holy Saturday, what we wanna do is talk about historical evidence for an actual resurrection. Now the course doesn't see the resurrection metaphysically in quite the same terms. It has a different interpretation, but it's, it's very clear that in its view, you know, there was an empty tomb, the body disappeared. He reappeared to followers, you know, all those seemingly unbelievable supernatural things happened. So the Course's view of the resurrection rests on those things happening, even while it reinterprets it. And so we'll talk on Saturday about what are the historical reasons for believing that happened. And there are some really good ones, yeah. surprisingly good, even though we're talking about ancient history, where you know, there were no, no um, cell phones around to record you know, on camera what happened. In spite of that, there are surprisingly good reasons for thinking it really happened. Yeah, and that's what I was alluding to in the introduction. If it, if it didn't happen, uh, we, first of all, we probably wouldn't even remember Jesus. But 
because it did, then it's it's a demonstration that what he taught was true. And so it it becomes the most significant event ever because it demonstrates that this isn't just a nice story or a story of a, a, a teacher who shared the principles of love, but in the end met a gruesome death. And oops, it 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 shows that love conquers all. And his life was was the demonstration of that. And you need a resurrection to have that demonstration. Yeah, I mean, the just to get on to Easter, the course says that that Easter, oddly enough, was also a teaching demonstration. Now, I don't know who's ever seen Easter as a teaching demonstration. Everyone sees it as this is kind of a victory for God, or God is giving his yes on Jesus, and Jesus's divinity is being proven. But again, like with the crucifixion, the Course says this was a teaching demonstration. And what was he teaching? He was teaching, as he says early in the text, that nothing can destroy truth, that good can withstand any form of evil because light abolishes all forms of darkness. That he was teaching that, that our true nature simply can't be killed, it can't be destroyed, it can't even be injured, that we are by nature completely invulnerable. And that's what he believed in the crucifixion, right? No matter what was happening to his body, he was invulnerable, he was not hurt, and the resurrection shows he was right. Look, he's completely unscathed. You know, nothing can destroy truth. Good can withstand any form of evil. Light abolishes all forms of darkness. And he says, that is the core lesson of the atonement. And if we accept that one idea, then our learning is complete. And he says that, that his resurrection therefore was, was the demonstration that everything else he taught was true. Right, and so with a demonstration, if the resurrection did happen, and I, I, I love when we go into these conversations about the, the evidence that, that it did, then again, th then Easter isn't just this, this parable. It isn't like a, a, right. a fiction that is, is a good story and it's teaching us a lesson. It's actually something that happened that demonstrates there is life after death. And, and so how can we carry that with us, not just on Easter Sunday, but all through our life so that we can walk in the world knowing that nothing can destroy truth and how different would we be as a result? You know, we yeah. wouldn't take offense to such little grievances or minor infractions on us. We, we, we would carry ourselves differently because we would know that just like Jesus, we can't be harmed. Yeah, and, and the, the message that we can't be harmed, you know, it does go way beyond life after death. Of course, I don't think it would even connect the resurrection particularly with, with that. It, its big message is who we are can't be harmed. And this world seems to be harming us all the time. I mean, you just gotta like read the news, go on social media, and it's a record of who says they've been harmed by whom. Right, so the idea that we can be harmed is we're soaked with it and, and we're feeling the effects of that all the time. If in fact we can't be harmed, if we are real and all those things that would harm us are not, which is like the course's whole philosophical foundation, then that changes everything. And it makes the resurrection a, a way of demonstrating the truth of the core of the course's teaching which is why he says it's the demonstration that everything else, everything else I taught was true. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. This is a world where it's like from the moment you open your eyes, you are faced with the assault of bad news. And it's almost like we can't recover from one instance of bad news, like global instance of bad, like the pandemic, for example, is followed by this war in Ukraine. And it's like, at what point, do, I mean, it, it, at what point is it just too much for us? Yeah, it just and keeps going. It 
just keeps coming and and that's the global assaults that doesn't even include the the problems and the challenges and the suffering that we experience within our own lives and in our own relationships and so this world feels uh like like it it's painful here (laughs) and (laughs) and so what jesus gives us is a model to look to to say that no matter what it is that you think can hurt you nothing ultimately can and and again who would we be if we truly embodied that message and carried with carried yeah, with us? and that's what i was always celebrating i know we're trying to wrap up here but that's what i was always celebrating evidently um, not <laughs> well you know <laughs> i know, <laughs> anyway, I know we need to i'm just kidding go ahead that's what i was always celebrating on easter morning it's like if easter really happened and the course is right that it was not a statement about Jesus it was a statement about reality. It was a mm-hmm. statement about reality that it means that what's really real can't be threatened, just like it says in the introduction in the course. You know, and what's unreal doesn't exist. And if the resurrection was like the physical proof of that, then in a sense, it is the most important thing that ever happened. And we should celebrate it. And we should, as course students, embrace it as our own rather than keeping it at, at a distance because, well, that's a, something the church does. <laughs> Jesus has such an embodiment of these two ideas that I love so much in the course. The, the idea that you're okay, you're safe, nothing can destroy truth. So go through your life knowing that. And also it is your job here to extend and help and heal all those that you can. And, and so I think it's from one place that the other works, yeah. Right? Yeah, right? But at the same time, there's just something so wonderful about him. I know you, you, this is out of print, but you wrote a book a long, long time ago about Jesus called Elder Brother. And I often repeat a line from that book, which is he is the most perfect thing to ever touch planet Earth. And I, I really feel so strongly about that. I I agree there. And it's not because he's God's son, because again, we're all God's son in the course. It's that he's a true, pure representation of unconditional love and and so from that sense he becomes a model for the rest of us to follow again when we think we can't get there we just look to him and say well he was able to so I can too and and so it's just a privilege and an honor to celebrate holy week through the course teachings and through the teachings of his life And again, we hope that you will join us as we go into all of these days more deeply, the teachings from all of these days more deeply. If you'd like to register for Holy Week, you can do that at circleofa.org forward slash events. Again, scholarships are available if you want to attend but are facing financial hardship. You can find information about those on the page as well. Robert, um, is there anything that you want to say about this before we sign off? Uh, I think just that uh, I really honor your passion for establishing this as a, a course tradition and a circle tradition. Um, you know, we should have our own annual traditions and we should, I mean, to me, Easter is the, is the most important day of the year. We should mm-hmm. celebrate every year. So yeah, this is our second year and uh, it'll be the second of a great many. Yeah, I really do see, I mean, the course is so young in the world. It's 46 years old. And if you compare that to Christianity, the gospels wouldn't even have been written yet, right? Like the gospels didn't even come until what, 70 AD, that sort of thing. So we're so young in the course's journey and the course is meant to be a helper of the world, is meant to be a healer of the world. It has wisdom that is just profound and deeply needed. And so it, it feels to me like those of us in the, in the course community right now are new disciples for Jesus' 
spreading this message in the world. It does not mean that there aren't other avenues to truth. I'm not talking about the superiority of the course in any way, shape, or form, but I do believe that if you are a course student, Jesus is your teacher. And so we have a, a responsibility to share the message of, and demonstrate the message as he did of unconditional love. I know we're trying to wrap up, but I can't resist adding this. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you ever seen the movie Risen with Joseph Fiennes? Uh, I was aware of it and I studiously avoided it actually. No. Yeah, I mean, there's there's things that you can say about the execution of the film. Like one example- No is pun they, intended. They really, oh, <laughs> clever. Um, <laughs> they, they really played up the idea of Mary Magdalene as a prostitute, which I don't agree with. But anyway, I, the, the intention of the movie, I think is really good. It's about a, a Roman guard who was, or commander really, who was there for the execution of Jesus slowly meets his followers and even has an experience of the risen Jesus and, and changes his whole philosophy. And so he goes from worshiping Mars, the God of war to following Jesus and this God of love. And so the movie's about his transformation. And, and I, I just feel like that's, that's the, power of Jesus in all of our lives like he can turn the cold hearted person into someone who is just soft and and seeing everyone as brothers and and loving and that's that's the remedy that's the healing that the world needs right now and and Jesus embodies it for all of us and so why wouldn't I have a passion about sharing that message I I I mean, I feel like it, it's contagious. You gave it to me and, and I'm sharing, we're both sharing it, but uh, there's just something so unique about him and, and so beautiful about him. And, uh, and I think we're here as new disciples to share it. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, we gotta go. But <laughs> what, one last thing, okay? One last thing in the movie, there's this scene where J Joseph finds meets, he's a follower of Jesus now, and he meets an old friend of his who is a Roman guard. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is the Roman guard going to let the Joseph finds, I forget the name of his character, but, um, and all the disciples through, or is he going to kill them all? Because he was there, that was his charge to kill them all. And, and Joseph finds character says to this Roman guard, think carefully, the world is in your hands right now. And I just, I was so moved by that because mm. I was like, that's not hyperbole, that's actually true. <laughs> the <laughs> world was in his, his hands. And, and of course that's, that's fiction and, and the, the, that exact scene didn't happen. But I feel like we're we're in that place right now as course students. Like it, we, again, we're the new disciples. It's our job to go out and spread this message of love and, uh, and we can do it because he did. Well, I almost want to watch it now. <laughs> I'll watch it again with you <laughs> if you okay. want. Okay, deal. All right, so I, I know I just started talking there, but do you want to say anything before we go? Well, I think we set it for now. Okay, we'll say more in Holy Week. So Lots join more. us, everyone, at circleofa.org forward slash events. We truly hope to see you there. And uh, I guess that's it. Bye for now.